Welcome everybody here at the Harvard Faculty Club this afternoon in Cambridge, Massachusetts for another in what is a series of online international conferences that the Boston Global Forum has been conducting over the past three years. The Boston Global Forum was created to see if we could take advantage of a lot of the learning and experience and wisdom of people here in the Boston area and focus every year on an important international issue. We began on the subject of occupational safety and health standards after the disasters in Bangladesh. And I'd like to think that we contributed to the dialogue, which has significantly improved that situation. And then we turned to the very difficult and very important question of how to create a framework for peace and security in the Pacific. And that has been our subject for the past several months. And today, we're going to try to conclude that discussion, although obviously our interest in this will be ongoing, because uh, the situation in the Pacific continues to be difficult. Uh, I don't think we've quite achieved the kind of international consensus that we hope we can achieve. So this is going to be a continuing effort. But today we're going to try to see if we can sum up our discussion of the course of the past several months and see if we can at least establish a uh, plan, set of principles that might govern relationships in that part of the world. And then we're going to go on to our topic for the coming year, which will be the whole issue of cyber warfare and what we do about it before we end up with another Cold War, only this time, on another aspect of international conflict. Um, for whatever reason, the world seems to, be, seems to be able to produce lots and lots of issues that we can deal with. And <laughs> there seem to be, never seemed to be a lack of them. But uh, it's been uh, wonderfully rewarding, I must say, for myself, and I think for my colleagues who were deeply involved in this, and especially for Tuan Nguyen, who was the creator of this, to um, get the kind of response we've got and the interest in seeing if we can't do some problem solving. And so uh, this afternoon, for the next couple of hours, we're going to uh, see if we can wrap up our discussion on the question of the framework for peace and security in the Pacific uh, with the help of some very, very good people and at least set the stage for what we hope will be some serious action on the international front in a collaborative way to deal with this problem and uh, minimize the conflict and maximize the kind of collaboration that we want to have. So with that, we're going to begin with David Sanger, the uh, Chief Washington Correspondent of the New York Times, who spends a little bit of his time up here in Cambridge at the Delta Center, and ask him to kick things off, and then we're going to have ourselves a good lively discussion for the next couple of hours. David? Thank you very much, Governor. It's great to be um, back here at the Global uh, Forum. It's a terrific series and always enjoyed uh, our discussions here. I thought that maybe the thing I could do that would be most useful at the beginning here, since I come to this more as a reporter than uh, true academic studying of these uh, uh, issues in the South China Sea, though we try to take them up in a, in a Harvard course at Grant House and I uh, uh, teach, is to talk a little bit about uh, the um, events that led up to the summit meeting between President Obama and President Xi just two and a half weeks ago, and how this issue played there, where it factored into the meeting and where we think it's headed. So as President Xi was preparing for this meeting and President Obama was trying to set the agenda for it, it was clear that there were some areas where they would be able to announce some significant progress. Climate change was the, the one that was the easiest because it required the Chinese merely to be announced the things that they were already planning to go do anyway. Uh, that the hardest issue was going to be cyber, 
the next topic that is, uh, Governor Takaka said will be taking up here. And that the one in which they were likely to make the least progress was the South China Sea. And that's essentially how it worked out. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But the subtext of the entire discussion between President Obama and uh, President Xi was to try to figure out whether or not Mr. Xi himself would be in a position to actually make many compromises, whether they could get a better read on the question of why they had misunderstood when President Xi first came to power two years ago, um, how aggressive he would be on these territorial issues. Remember, when President Xi took over, he had come to the United States just a few months before, taken a tour with Vice President Biden, went back to the House in Iowa where he had uh, visited as a, uh, as a young uh, party official. Um, said all the right things. And many in the Obama White House thought that he was going to pursue the line that Hu Jintao's state counselor, uh, Dai Bing Hua, had written about at the end of President Hu's time, which was basically an essay that said, don't challenge the United States right now or any other major power. Focus on the domestic economy. Consolidate your power. But um, follow what Deng Xiaoping would tell us to do, which was basically bide our time. The moment will come to deal with all these issues. And most of the intelligence reports that were floating around to the White House, the State Department, uh, the Defense Department, strongly seemed to suggest that the United States thought she would do exactly that. That they had it wrong. They got right the Xi Jinping that wanted to go deal with corruption, with uh, consolidating his power, they got wrong the risk taker side of Xi. And so what did we see happen? We saw a huge rise in the cyber attacks, which were going on anyway uh, at this time. And then we also saw uh, a significant rise uh, in the activity in the South China Sea, including the building of the islands, of the, the pictures there for They're not really islands, I guess I would say, building military facilities on half-submerged reefs. The president decided to try to deal with cyber first, and that didn't go anywhere in his first meetings with uh, President Xi, which were at Sunnylands. Um, and in the area of, of the territorial challenges, the first thing that the president had to go face uh, was the declaration of the air defense identification zone that the Chinese had uh, declared over a very broad area. And the US response to that was to immediately send some B-52s right through the middle of the zone in order to make the point that the US didn't recognize uh, this. But with the islands, they've been much more cautious. There have been a number of naval activities around these, this new construction, but nothing that went inside the 12-mile limit that the Chinese declared, because the Chinese, of course, are playing the game of saying that this is truly their territory, and therefore they've got 12 miles around it. Um, the Navy and uh, the new uh, head of PACOM, uh, Admiral Harry Harris, pressed very hard to um, very hard internally to send one of those missions within 12 miles prior to the Xi visit. And this was rejected by the White House for fear that it would poison the atmosphere of the visit and force the Chinese to take some kind of harder line than they thought was necessary. All of the indications we have now is that those uh, that mission to go inside the 12 mile area or within 12 miles of these, um, of these reefs is likely to happen in the next few weeks now that the visit is over. That um, Admiral Harris won his point, he just didn't win his timing. Now, the bigger question is the one that Bob Gates used to put so wonderfully whenever um, some kind of major project was uh, proposed for the military. 
Well, he, asked, he used to say that the three words um, least asked in Washington are, and then what? And the interesting question for uh, the Navy right now, as we get ready to build inside uh, uh, these limits, is the and then what question. Because it's not at all clear to us uh, at this point how the Chinese are going to respond. The betting is that the Chinese will harass and follow these ships, but won't do anything that is overtly hostile. But it is a big game of chicken, because the Chinese have looked at President Obama and calculated, quite rightly, that we're not going to risk a military conflict for a group of reefs that, until two years ago, were of largely of interest for fishing purposes. And they've got that right. If you look across the range of the activities that President Obama has engaged in or not, he has very much followed the light footprint strategy. That is to say, he's willing to use cyber assets, he's willing to go use drones, uh, he's willing to uh, arm rebels occasionally and uh, train uh, allies, whether they are the Iraqis or, uh, or others, but he's not willing to go be in a position that's going to risk a significant uh, uh, conflict. In this particular case, I think they're calculating that G is willing to risk it. I mean, Xi's got other problems right now. And what made this summit particularly fascinating it was, was, was the first one in years, you might argue two decades, in which a Chinese leader showed up in Washington in a position of weakness rather than one of strength, largely out of the economic downturn, which has led us to question whether or not the length and degree of support that Xi Jinping has is as great as we initially were saying, or even were saying six months ago when people were making the case that he's the strongest Chinese leader since Chen Shopei. So that's the situation that we are headed into now. I think the president wants very much to make the point that we do not recognize this uh, territory as Chinese territory. Uh, at the press conference with President Xi, he went out of his way to say the United States will fully respect international law. Uh, on these issues and expects the Chinese to as well. And that was interpreted by the Chinese as a sign that he would, in fact, start the mission up that they're going to head into. I think the bigger question is, can you keep this issue from becoming a very big one in the relationship? And can you persuade the Chinese that most of what they're doing right now is taking uh, the uh, other regional players and driving them right into the American camp. And the American argument is, that's just what happens. This is happening now. The Filipinos are talking about reopening a version of Clark Air Base. To do that, they're going to have to throw FedEx out of Clark Air Base. Good luck with that. Um, uh, the Vietnamese uh, had been suddenly very interested in talks with the United States. And here we had the remarkable sight uh, just a few months ago of a leader of the Vietnamese Communist Party sitting in the Oval Office having a nice chat and a cup of coffee with the President of the United States. And for anybody in the room um, old enough to remember uh, Vietnam, that is a pretty mind-ending concept. So I think over the next year or two, the United States sees a moment not necessarily of the upper hand, but certainly of some leverage here. And that's something probably worth our exploring. I think I've probably gone longer than I promised the governor I would, so I will leave it at that. But I hope this gives you a little bit of a snapshot of where we are today. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. I'm ready to speak. Have you got the presentation? Um, you can actually uh, play the rhythm on your next song and share it. You can now do that. Uh, you want to have a risk? Okay, we'll give it a go. All right, this yes, is uh, this. I think okay. this is Bill Hayden from London. Twan? Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Come on, Bill, and talk to us. Hi there. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, thank you very much to Hong Twan for the invitation. <laughs> um, I want to. Possibly ropey uh, internet connections. 
the forces were this. I will attempt to just launch a PowerPoint presentation.